All right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Mike Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We are a webinar. Um, it's a uh, similar to a podcast, but we have pictures and video <laughs> that we um, are able to add as well. Um, we broadcast live uh, every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. The show, um, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. The show is recorded and is close, the recordings are posted to our website um, later. And I will show you um, at the end of today's show where you can see all the recordings um, that you can watch. Uh, both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues who might be interested in any of our topics. Um, there's no restriction on who can attend. You don't have to be working in a library or at a, or a librarian or anything. Um, anyone can go ahead and watch if there's something that they might find interesting out there. Um, we do do a variety of things here on Encompass Live. Um, everything is library related though. Uh, book reviews, um, interviews, training sessions, demos of services and products, uh, information about things that we think you might find interesting. Uh, specific programs and uh, things that the Library Commission is doing sometimes we have on the show. Um, but as I said, everything is library related. Uh, you might look at some topics or some titles of sessions and wonder why it's on there, but trust me, it has something to do with libraries in the end. That's my whole goal here. Um, we do have, uh, as I said, sessions about library commission programs. So we have Commission Nebraska Library Commission staff on, but we also have um, bringing guest speakers, and that's what we have this morning. To my left here is Mindy Rush Chipman, who is she came down from Omaha this morning to join us from the Justice for Our Neighbors Nebraska um, booth that's up there. Um, and this is a session that I saw that Mindy did at um, Library Strength Team Training Day, which was a uh, one-day workshop in this past summer done up in the northeast part of Nebraska, our Three Rivers Library System held a one-day um, one day session of workshops, but also some different things that are library related. And this was on the agenda there, so I invited Mindy to come on and say, hey. Let's share it with more people beyond the ones that were there. Um, <clears throat> and her topic is, as you can see, empowering immigrant community members through education and information. Um, immigrants, refugees coming to our country, it's a huge topic of interest right now um, for people and, and libraries who serve anybody coming in. So um, Mindy's going to tell us how we can um, help them and what resources you guys have to help as well. Yeah, exactly. So I'll just hand it over to you and take it away. Thank you. Like Krista said, my name is Mindy. I'm an attorney with Justice for Neighbors Nebraska. Uh, Justice for Neighbors is a nonprofit law firm. We serve um, the entire state of Nebraska, also parts of Iowa, and we help our clients <clears throat> with immigration legal matters and also any ancillary legal matters that they may have. So what that means is we can help a client more holistically, mm -hmm. not just with their immigration case, but also with their if they are needing a protection order, a divorce a will, power of attorney, things of that nature. Um, so I'm really excited um, for my work at Justice for Neighbors, obviously, but I, I didn't intend on becoming an attorney. Uh, <laughs> I actually uh, was a librarian before I became an attorney. I was a prison librarian. Right, I got, that's what you said. That's yeah, cool. Yeah, so I've always kind of been interested in access to information, access to justice, mm -hmm. but it was working at the prison that kind of um, mm -hmm. encouraged me to go to law school. You're a prison librarian here in Nebraska? I was okay. at the Diagnostic and Evaluation Center, oh, definitely. Cool. And my dream was uh, to become a law librarian. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an immigration attorney right now, but I do um, feel that uh, one of the most rewarding parts of my job is providing access to information. So mm -hmm. that's librarian. Yeah, yeah. and, um, and having the MLS and the law degree—that's the perfect combo for getting becoming a law librarian. Yes. Right, <laughs> and libraries play a vital role in our communities at making sure people have access to information that can protect them from uh, particularly unethical uh, attorneys or non-attorneys that are trying to take advantage of our immigrant community members. Um, 
I think I have slides later that show that libraries are one of the first resources that immigrants and refugees will use after resettling in our communities. And so the mixture between a law firm and a library I think is vital, especially in our rural communities. So mm -hmm. um, what we're going to talk about today is just a basic introduction on immigration law. Um, I went to law school for three years, I've been practicing for several years, and I still just know a little bit about immigration now, <laughs> so there's obviously no way that I can um, relate everything there is to know, and the law is changing every day, as of course. you know, you know, there's new executive orders that are issued mm -hmm. all the time, and we talk about I know, those. yeah, I saw we're going to talk about some of that, yeah, yeah of course. Um, but what I can do in this short period of time is maybe, um, break some misconceptions that um, we may have, our family members, our patrons, our coworkers may have about the immigration legal system. And then I'll go into a little bit more about how we can help our immigrant and refugee community members, especially in this political climate, a lot of our immigrant community members who um, do not have a permanent form of immigration status mm -hmm. or maybe undocumented are particularly vulnerable and worried okay. and coming to our law firms and our libraries is asking what can they do and so um, the second part of the presentation we'll talk about a rights and safety planning guide that I helped um, Justice for Neighbors helped prepare and that's something that librarians can refer their patrons to as just kind of a guide like we can't control everything there may not be an immigration form of relief for you right now but there are some steps that you can take to protect yourself and to give yourself as much power and preparation as possible mm -hmm. Um, just uh, like we talked about, libraries are really uh, vital in many of our immigrant and refugee community members' lives. Um, not only is there access to information, but a lot of libraries actually um, pride themselves in conducting, conducting programming targeted to our new Americans. Mm -hmm. So a lot of libraries provide immigration information. They provide sometimes citizenship classes, English classes, things of that nature. And so the libraries just generally have been a great source of security, safety, and information for our new community members. So that um, brings up what we've been talking about. Um, who are the members of our community, both immigrant and non-immigrant? Um, there's really two main classifications of our community members, and those are citizens and non-citizens, right? Mm -hmm. But within those two categories, there's a lot of different ways that we can obtain um, classification within those categories. Um, United States citizens, we all know that if you're born in the United States, you're automatically a United States citizen. But there are a few other ways that you can obtain your citizenship. Um, probably the most common is by naturalization, and that's mm -hmm. something that we've probably heard about it's where you've obtained permanent residency through some path and we'll talk about how difficult and restrictive the paths to residency actually are but if you're able to become a lawful permanent resident then um, you maintain your residency for a certain period of years then you apply have to pay a hefty uh, fee mm -hmm. get a medical exam take a citizenship mm -hmm. test which um, it's not super difficult, but it's not things that I would be able to pass. I saw, yeah, so many people I've seen who are born citizens start to take those tests. Like, I don't know. A lot of it, I think, is things. I learned that when I was in the like, history class in third grade, and right. now I just don't remember. Right, <laughs> right. But the test mm -hmm. um, in the interview is English, um, mm -hmm. only um, unless you can unless there's a medical reason that you can waive that English requirement. But so the English um, test and the civics test it has a writing and a speaking and a reading portion. Very difficult, but once you uh, pass and you become a naturalized citizen, you have the same rights and responsibilities as a natural born citizen. So that's one common misconception that we can talk about right now is natural born citizens and natural, naturalized citizens are the same. Um, in very, very rare circumstances, your naturalization, um, your citizenship can be revoked, but that's primarily if you obtained your citizenship through fraud. Yeah. Um, there, 
when I've gone out to communities and talked to immigrant community groups, there is a misconception that naturalized citizens are second class citizens, but that's just not the case. Like I yeah, said, no same thing, rights yeah. and responsibilities as natural born citizens. The other two ways of attaining your citizenship are a little bit more obscure, but um, you can acquire your citizenship from your parents. So even if you're born outside the United States, as mm -hmm. long as one or more of your parents are a citizen mm -hmm. and they've lived in the United States for a certain period of time after a certain age, and it, it goes the law is always changing in this um, category, and uh, your acquisition is determined by the law that was in place the year that you were born. Mm -hmm. um, but what that means is people that were born outside the United States may have acquired their citizenship and not even know it. Um, derivation is, is also um, complicated, but in a nutshell, it's if your parents naturalized and you were a permanent resident under the age of 18, you automatically derived your citizenship from your parents. Yeah. What that means is the children don't have to go through it themselves. Exactly. Yeah. But um, oftentimes that families don't know about derivation. So you will have um, moms or dads um, taking their their oath of citizenship. And if you have never been to a citizenship ceremony, you should go. They're very powerful, moving. Even if you don't know anyone that's there, they're, it's still very powerful, moving. But you'll have a lot of children that are in the audience watching their mom or dad take the oath. And what they may not know is they're also becoming citizens at the exact but same time them. their parents are. So the reason that I bring up this. Very emotional. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the reason I bring up acquisition and derivation is just because oftentimes people don't know. Like, we can't judge, um, we can't determine whether or not somebody's a citizen or not a citizen by the way they look, or even sometimes what they say, because it's so, um, you can acquire direct citizenship and not even know it. I've had clients come into my office um, wanting to apply for a form of immigration relief, and after doing a consultation, we find out that they're, they're already, already. <laughs> Yeah, that's happened. Um, that's too bad, they don't even know. Yeah. So that's just one thing, you know, for having conversations at Thanksgiving or whatever. It, I always like to bring up that you, we cannot judge somebody's citizenship based upon anything because oftentimes it's so, so complex many different ways, yeah. that the person themselves may not even know. Then we can flip into the non-citizen category, and we've already talked about lawful permanent residents. These are immigrants that intend on making the United States their home. Um, they found a path to residency, and they've obtained their lawful permanent residency or their LPR status. This is also called, um, referred to as green card holders. The LPR cards used to be green. They're not green right now, but in the future, they're going back to green. Oh, really? So green, okay. card <laughs> green card holders is actually an okay way of describing LPRs. Um, but the one thing that's important to mention about LPRs is even if the LPR card or the green card has an expiration date on it, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that the residency has an expiration date. The residency is indefinite, can last forever um, until it's affirmatively taken away. Mm -hmm. So if we have a, a lawful permanent resident that commits a crime, that residency can be taken away and that person can be put into removal or deportation proceedings. Mm -hmm. However, just because their green card um, expires, that has no effect. On their, on their residency, it's just the proof of residency. Mm -hmm. So that's another common misconception when we have um, residents where their cards expire. It's very difficult for them to get services and, mm -hmm. and maybe even obtain their employment, but really it's just the card expiring for the most part. And that's something they can get renewed easily or? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, discover. referring to Justice for Neighbors, another nonprofit or a reputable immigration attorney, that process mm -hmm. is relatively easy mm -hmm. unless there's something strange that's happened between the time they've obtained their residency and they need to renew. So if there's a criminal conviction, then you definitely have to talk to an attorney to talk about your steps forward. It's like it's similar to your license expires, but that doesn't mean you're no longer, I mean, you're, you're still, you know, you know, it's supposed to drive, but <laughs> right. you're still a citizen, you're still... Yeah, yeah there are you're, definitely... Or you're whatever similarities. your state ID is, yeah. Yeah, there are definitely similarities. But the, the thing that was um, surprising for me to learn when I started practicing immigration law is lawful permanent residency is indefinite. You can keep it forever. Um, there's certain things that you have to do to maintain your residency. Like, you cannot leave the United States for more than six months in a row without mm -hmm. getting permission first. Mm -hmm. um, if you do that, it, you may be... Um, found to have um, abandoned your residency. Mm -hmm. There's some other 
other things that you need to keep in mind if you're intending on applying for naturalization. Um, but that's that's one type of non-citizen lawful permanent resident. There's other people that are in our communities that are fleeing persecution, and these are going to be our refugees, our asylees, um, for the most part. Refugees and asylees um, really have the same criteria that they have to prove. Um, in order to obtain that classification, they have to prove that they are fearful of returning to their home country because of persecution. And they have to prove that they're going to be particularly at risk of being persecuted based upon something about themselves that they cannot change. Mm -hmm. So they have to be fearful of persecution based upon their race, religion, national origin, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. Um, the difference between refugees and asylees is simply where they applied for that protection status. Refugees um, have to live in a refugee camp outside of their home country and they get the classification of re refugee before they enter the United States, whereas an asylee will be in the United States and affirmatively apply for asylum status from within the United States. So they were already here and then something happened potentially in their home country. Yeah, that that's, made them realize, though, this is, if I go back now, this is going to be bad. That, yeah. that is one great example. However, that raises a good issue. Mm -hmm. um, refugees have to start in a refugee camp mm -hmm. um, in order to immigrate as a refugee. There are no refugee camps in Central and South America. So while we do have um, people that are fleeing persecution based upon their race, religion, national origin, and political opinion, membership in a uh, particular social group, mm -hmm. um, there's no way that they can enter the United States as a refugee. Right. No way. So the if the the, group. that's right, that's group, right, yeah. and it's much more difficult to um, have your asylum application approved than it is to have your mm -hmm. refugee application approved. They're mm -hmm. both the refugee process is very difficult and long. Um, however, the criteria um, if you're in a refugee camp um, is is e easier to get. Um, approved by the adjudicator. The asylum applications are adjudicated more stringently and the approval rate of asylum applications are not that high. Um, and one thing that's also important to mention is asylum applications are pending for a long time and sometimes when your application is pending you can apply for work authorization. Mm -hmm. So what that means is um, we have had um, immigrant community members taken advantage of by non-attorneys or unethical attorneys by mm -hmm. filing asylum applications even though the person may not qualify. Mm -hmm. Getting a work permit so their client thinks that they've done miracles mm -hmm. only to find out that eventually the asylum application is going to be denied and that person is going to be placed in removal and deportation proceedings. Mm -hmm. So asylum is definitely not an option for everyone. You have to be fearful of persecution based upon something about yourself that you can't change. It cannot just be um, you're afraid of returning to your home country because it's very dangerous. So that's the refugee asylum category. The next category is people that are in our communities with temporary permission. There are several subcategories within this category, but the two main subcategories are TPS, which is Temporary Protected Status, mm -hmm. and DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Mm -hmm. Both of those programs um, are at risk of going away um, yes. because of the, the current administration, and in fact, um, the current administration has ended the DACA program, and we'll talk mm -hmm. more about that in a little bit, but it's basically was a program that provided temporary permission for young people mm -hmm. who were brought to the country at a very young age and met certain criteria and would allow the young people to obtain a driver's license, social security number, work authorization, the ability to go to college, things mm -hmm. of that nature. That program is going away, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Mm -hmm. TPS is for people that are in the United States, but it's unsafe for them to return to their home country because of civil warfare, natural disaster, things of that nature. And the administration is in control of which countries qualify for TPS designation and how long that designation is going to last. So that's different from the asylees because it's not something about them. It's something happening totally that, yeah, that is country. not, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and um, the administration is definitely taking away those TPS designations for lots of different countries. Um, but it is a, an option for some. So it's important to still talk to an attorney or a legal representative. Mm -hmm. And then the other, the next category is non-immigrants. So these are people in our communities who have permission to be in the United States, but for a specific period of time for a specific purpose. 
visas. So these are people that are here on a visitor visa, people that are here on a student visa. Um, they can be actors, doctors, you know, there's a specific purpose that they've been granted permission to be in the United States and it's only for a specific time frame. Once that purpose or that time no longer applies or they've overstayed, then um, they will no longer be a non-immigrant and they will move into the next category, which is undocumented. And the next slide just kind of talks about um, that using the word undocumented is important. We could also say like non-citizen, non-resident, but undocumented mm -hmm. is, is more appropriate than describing someone as an illegal. Right. I know that um, the administration and the Immigration and Nationality Act are referred to people that are undocumented as legal aliens, mm -hmm. but that term is not necessarily correct and it's dehumanizing no. in the way that it describes a person as being illegal. Um, if I, well, being in the United States without current immigration status is not a crime, right? Sometimes if you've enter the United States without authorization, you can invoke crimes, mm -hmm. um, especially if you're traveling with someone else, if you're sharing water, blankets, food, you could be mm -hmm. actually committing smuggling and not even, uh, so sometimes there are crimes. There's all those different, yeah. Yeah, but for the most part, being in the United States without permission is definitely not a crime, but even if there was a crime committed, um, we still shouldn't refer to that person as illegal. It's just mm -hmm. like, you know, if I committed a crime, um, if I got a DUI, you would not refer to me as a, an illegal person. You would, you know, you would refer to me as, oh, she, she, committed a crime. she, mm -hmm. you know, she got convicted of a crime, whatever. Um, and as far as numbers, there's over 11 million undocumented individuals in the United wow. States. So, um, I thought this was kind of cool, so we talked yeah. about, you know, not using the term illegal, and I thought it was really cool because ALA did um, insist, or they made a resolution to encourage the Library of Con Congress subject heading to mm -hmm. not use the term illegal alien anymore. And in response, um, the illegal alien term was replaced with non-citizen, and mm -hmm. um, if we're talking about, um, migration without authorization, mm -hmm. the terms non-citizen and, and authorized immigration can be combined together. You guys probably know more about this than I do, <laughs> but I think it's very cool and it just relates back to that that mm -hmm. first slide that the words that we met, that we use really do matter. And that what you said at the beginning too, that libraries have, are a place where some um, undocumented people, they go there, refugees and immigrants go there, and libraries are already ahead of the curve from some other organizations right. and supporting them right. and being accepting of, of it and not derogatory right. to them. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if the like brands are generally good like that. <laughs> I think so too, but it's, it's just idea. you know yeah. if before I started practicing immigration law, um, I didn't necessarily understand the negative connotation associated with the yeah. term of the alien. So it just becomes so common to say you don't even think about it. Right. And, and it's also yeah. used in our federal and state legislation right um, but as I've been you know working more in this field when I hear it, it I, I just cringe and I think that someday we'll all you know mm -hmm. feel that but it's not the case right now so you know if we're at, if we're in the library and a patron comes and they're asking a question and they're responded th the response they get is well are you, are you illegal you know mm -hmm. that may prevent that person from feeling comfortable and safe in the library that they must absolutely yeah Okay, so another misconception breaker is um, we've all heard the question, you know, I'm okay with immigration, but they have to do it legally. Why don't they just get in line, right? We've all heard that. Mm -hmm. um, as I talked about before, the only way that you can become a citizen is by becoming a lawful permanent resident and then meeting certain criteria. Well, in order to become a lawful permanent resident, you have to start uh, with a certain type of case, a certain type of application. And unfortunately, there's not an application or not a type of relief available for everyone. Mm -hmm. There is not a line that you can stand in, not an application you can fill out and just wait for your turn. That's just not. It doesn't work that way. It does not. It hasn't that been set up. That way, no. It has not been. It used to be that way, but it's not that way right now. So, um, and until the DACA, there was nothing for children like that. I mean, that, that's why that was created too, because there wasn't right. any wasn't even anything 
organized right, for that type right. of situation. That's right. And there is the DREAM Act, which is pending in front mm -hmm. of the legislature right now. The DREAM mm -hmm. Act has been introduced in front of Congress a number of times, and it's never been successfully passed. We're hopeful that um, with all of the controversy around terminating mm -hmm. the DACA program with the DREAM Act, oh, yeah. we'll um, have some more positive momentum. A lot of people now. are standing up and coming forward, to, yeah. Yeah. voicing their opinions a lot yeah. stronger than I think they ever have before. Right. So it's really important that DACA use um, talk to an, a reputable immigration attorney to see if there's any form of relief available for them, mm -hmm. but there's likely not because mm -hmm. the reason that they applied for DACA was because there was no They other didn't form. have, they tried all these and it didn't fit, yeah. So the four main forms of relief that you can apply for to work towards your permanent residency are the diversity program, employment-based immigration, family-based immigration, and humanitarian forms of relief. The diversity program and employment-based immigration, Justice for Neighbors doesn't work a lot in. Um, the diversity program is just it's a diversity lottery program. People call it the diversity lottery because it, it literally is like a lottery. Mm -hmm. It was created to um, increase the diversity in the United States. Um, but what that means is countries with high um, migration rates uh, do not have the availability for their um, nationals to apply for the diversity visa program. So the idea is we already have enough yeah. people coming from there. This is for the countries that we did not have a lot. So we right. want to encourage more people right. from those areas. So right now um, clients from Mexico, India, China, Philippines, uh, countries with high migration rates uh, mm -hmm. are not eligible to apply for the diversity program. And um, some of the requirements just really knock out most of my clientele for this um, program. You mm -hmm. have to have internet access to apply, which mm -hmm. a lot of my clients don't in their home countries and sometimes they oh. don't have internet access mm. here unless they go to the library. Go to the library, um, yes. Yeah. Our libraries yeah. can get you there. <laughs> yes, definitely. You, and then oftentimes you have to prove um, educational requirements or that you've worked as a professional for a certain number of years. And when we're uh, working with clients that have been subjected to extreme poverty and violence and things of that nature, they're not able to meet these criteria. So it's not an option for everyone. If it is an option, then it's just simply applying for the lottery and hoping mm -hmm. that you become eligible for a visa, but not everybody does. It's a low percentage of people that apply that actually benefit from the program. Mm -hmm. Employment-based immigration means that you have to have a skill, you have to have an employer that's willing to petition for you, and they have to prove that your skill um, is so important because there's not enough skilled workers in that from, particular yeah. area. Mm -hmm. so it's very difficult, but um, you, in these cases, the employer can afford to hire an attorney, and so they don't need nonprofit help, so I don't work a lot with employment-based immigration. So that in that case, your employer would do the work for yeah. you to try and get yep. that money. They have to start the yeah. process, definitely. So that's not an option for most of our clients. Um, Family-based immigration and humanitarian forms of relief are primarily what we work with at Justice for Neighbors. Um, family-based immigration, basically you have to have a family member that's related to you in a certain way that has a certain type of status to mm -hmm. apply for you, to prove that relationship. Mm -hmm. And the time that you have to wait to get your visa to enter the United States and adjust to a lawful permanent resident depends on our relationship and the person who's applying for your status. So that would be like if you married somebody who was from another country, you're an American citizen and you met someone and you married That's them, right. then that would be how they would right. eventually right. <laughs> become a citizen right. as well. Yeah. Um, so the, the relationship, it can't be just any type of relation like um, uh, a lawful permanent resident cannot petition for their son or daughter if their son or daughter is married. Oh, um, they're already married, okay. You, mm -hmm. you can't petition, your, your grandparent can't petition for a grandchild. Um, mm -hmm. Lawful permanent resident can't petition for a sister uh, or brother. Um, husband and wife of a U.S. citizen, that would be considered an immediate relative, and that visa should be available immediately. However, the process sometimes can take over a year, so it's not necessarily immediate. When you go down into the preference categories, those are for the release, those are for the petitioners who are lawful permanent residents or um, United States citizens, and the relationship is more extended. So, um, this is a circumstance where if you have the right type of uh, relative who's willing to start this process for you, there may be a line that you can get into to wait for the visa. Mm -hmm. But the line sometimes is um, so restrictive it can bump you out, and it also is so long that you can die waiting. 
So the example, <laughs> the example that I can give is um, if a United States citizen petitions for their sibling, mm -hmm. um, first of all, the citizen has to be over 21 before they can petition for anyone. Mm -hmm. They have to prove their relationship with their sibling. And once they've done so, it'll depend on the um, country of origin of their mm -hmm. sibling. So mm -hmm. if that sibling is a national of Mexico, those applications are currently being processed from 1996. Wow, that's old there. Okay. Right, so we're talking like tw that person's Is that because there's just so many there's of so them? Many that, oh, okay. There's so many, and so, and there's not enough visas. There's a limited number of visas that are so offered. A little number of openings to, yeah. Right, but the thing is the, the processing does not move with the way that our time moves. So, um, and, you know, that visa processing chart that tells me that they're processing those type of applications from 1996, mm -hmm. it's going to stay stagnant for a few months. Mm -hmm. So what that means is it's not a 20 year wait. Mm -hmm. It means that the wait is going to get longer and longer as the years mm -hmm. go on. So there's been an attorney who's been follow following the numbers and the processing times and his estimation is that if someone applies for their brother or sister right now, it will be 150 year wait. Wow. So it's not that's really, not really the route to go. It's not really <laughs> the route. Sometimes it's people's only option, though, so they're willing to apply and then and maybe something will change with how the process works or how the system is doing right. it. Yeah. But another unfortunate thing is, like I said, um, permanent residents can't petition for their son or daughter if they're married. Um, sometimes, you know, families really haven't been advised, and so they'll petition for their single children, mm -hmm. and then their children will make decisions like you and I make, and we make the decision to get married, and, and that decision to get married will kick them out of line yeah. and they won't know it. So I oftentimes, realize. you know, I've had clients that come in and they say, you know, I've had this application pending for X number of years only um, to have to break the news that it's no longer a realistic, it's no longer a valid for that person. Humanitarian forms of relief are, we already talked about refugee and asylum, asylum however, there are other um, humanitarian forms of relief, um, particularly for victims of domestic violence or other specific crimes. Mm -hmm. So valid events, again, Women Act, self petitioners, the UV suit, the TV. So these are for, for um, victims, and it's to encourage the victims to be able to report their crime. Um, especially in domestic violence cases, uh, if somebody doesn't have immigration status, it's a way that the perpetrator can kind of um, exacerbate the cycle of violence. Mm -hmm. They'll use the lack of immigration status to keep the threaten person. them with that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so these forms of relief are just really a way of saying, you know what? You know, there may be a form of relief available that you can work towards your residency um, and also allow you to, you know, escape the the domestic violence or whatever mm -hmm. a dangerous situation you're in. Yeah. Um, there's also a special immigrant juvenile status. That's for kids that have been abused and neglected by one or more of their parents. And that abuse and neglect can happen in home country or it can happen in the United States. And um, neglect, um, even if our if these kids always say, you know, that their mom or dad didn't intentionally neglect them, mm -hmm. um, not having enough money for food, not having water, not having proper clothing, those Mm -hmm. are considered neglectful in mm -hmm. our society. So oftentimes, if you have unaccompanied minors that are entering the United States and resettling in our communities, this may be an option. Mm -hmm. There's one um, catch, though. You have to have a Nebraska or a state court order um, with certain findings in that order up kind of affirming the abuse of animal neglect. So that it has to be investigated yes, and shown that it's happening. Right. Yeah. And so in Nebraska, the age of majority is 19. So we have to have that Nebraska state order before the kiddo turns 19. Mm -hmm. um, we then have until the kiddo is 21 to apply for the special immigrant juvenile status. But what this means is if there's a young person that you're working with and they're undocumented, um, it's a good idea to refer them to an immigration attorney to talk because if this is mm -hmm. a viable form of relief, they may age out of it and not so you gotta get out quickly. Right. Yeah. There's lots of youth in the foster care system that are aging out of their ability to apply for SIJ status, even though they would qualify qualify for it. So it's something to keep on our radars. A lot of times I get asked where are undocumented community members safe? And by safe, um, we mean safe from raids or safe from um, 
immigration enforcement. So immigration and customs enforcement or ICE, that's the that's the branch of the Department of Homeland Security that used to be known as uh, the INS. Or like when people talk about like immigration, um, they're talking about ICE officers. Mm -hmm. And Nebraska has a history of being subjected to large scale enforcement operations like raids. Um, this happened ten years ago in Grand Island where um, mm -hmm. workplaces were raided and children, mm -hmm. moms and dads were detained and children had no place to go. So, so this is something that our community members are very scared of. It's a very, it's a very real fear mm -hmm. because it's happened before and it could happen again. Um, there has been a memo um, issued. It's been issued a long time ago, but it's still valid until mm -hmm. it's, um, not uh, at the whim of the administration, but I did put a memo out, memo out that these type of um, raids or enforcement actions are not to happen at certain sensitive locations. And the reason I bring it up is because I think there's an argument to be made that libraries should be included I as see a that they're not, yeah. They're not, though. So they're not specifically referred to. But because of what we talked about, because of the educational programming that libraries provide, I think mm -hmm. there's an argument to be made that it should be included under schools, but it's not affirmatively included. So we'll talk uh, in a little bit about things we can do to make our libraries more safe from this type of um, large-scale enforcement. But um, it's important that we can let our patrons know that it is safe to take your kids to school. It's safe mm -hmm. to go to school. There's not going to be raids at school. It's safe to go to the hospital when you're sick. Um, I have partnerships with several hospitals here in the Omaha, or in the Omaha area where um, people wait until the very, very last minute to seek medical services because they're scared of being reported, they're scared of immigration enforcement. But that just, it doesn't happen. Um, another sensitive or safe location was churches or other religious institutions. So mm -hmm. um, worshiping, going to funerals, weddings, things of that nature, you should be safe. And also public demonstrations should be safe as well. Um, sometimes we have large scale and rates. rates. Um, Presentations or like in response to the DACA program being ended, mm -hmm. we've had uh, press releases and demonstrations, and, oh, and yeah. those yeah. things should be safe. Marches, rallies, things of that nature, they should be safe from immigration mm -hmm. enforcement. As How long as nothing, nothing, you don't in, in, engage in anything at those demonstrations, that's illegal. So that's, right. For anybody, that's right. crossing the line. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so that would be that you're opening yourself up to interaction with local police or local law enforcement and local law enforcement if you're undocumented then can you put your doc undocumented status to, to ICE and so you'd be on the radar that way. So safe lo locations means safe from, from enforcement mm -hmm. um, but not specific enforcement. So if somebody has a specific um, warrant out for them. Um, there's nothing that would prevent an immigration officer from going to a rally to pick up a certain individual. That's different. That's yes. just yeah. completely different. Right. This is this memo. It's extenuating circumstances. Yeah. Um, so how, what can libraries do? I think like we talked about earlier is just having reliable information that your patrons need um, and even having it without them asking I think is important because um, you may not have a patron ask like, hey, what? <laughs> Where are safe locations? Or how can I find a reputable immigration attorney? They might not ask. They might just. It might be scared to even mention it. Right. Yeah. So having information accessible, um, I think, is really important. Um, and like we talked about, libraries aren't necessarily included on the in the sensitive location memo. However, if you work with your board and you work with um, your uh, director and your management to have directives for what if. What if we have an immigration officer come to the library? What what right. would we do? We have policies. So having a policy in place, I think, is a good idea. One thing that's important to to mention is that immigration officers can come into public spaces, so they can come into the library without a warrant. However, they can't come into private areas without a warrant. So if you have a meeting room or offices or a certain area that's not necessarily open for public, that would be a place where patrons could go to feel safe. Um, and they wouldn't have, be subjected to immigration enforcement without a warrant or permission to go into that private area. So if your library is interested in learning more about things like that, feel free to give me, shoot me an email or give me And a that also extends to our usual, and not even just related to immigrants and refugees, but anybody, records, circulation records, information about what they're doing 
you, they need a warrant to get all of that right. from you at the library as well. It doesn't matter if they're ICE or what they're asking for. They need a warrant to have you provide, if you have it, any of that personal information about how anybody has used the library. Right. And I feel like those stances and those policies that have already been developed are they're in line thing. with also mm -hmm. um, being advocates for, for preventing just this random type of immigration enforcement mm -hmm. that we might see happening again. Um, so why is it important for libraries to think about this right now? Well, earlier this year, there were some executive orders that the administration announced that really changed the way that immigration was perceived in our communities. Um, President Obama, he created the DACA program, mm -hmm. but he also really prioritized um, immigration enforcement to start with criminal offenders, recent um, immigrants that immigrated without authorization and people that are threats to national security. The reason that that makes sense is because, like, it really makes sense, like yeah. we talked about before, there's over 11 million undocumented people in the United States, right? Yeah. We only have the funds to put 400,000 people into removal or deportation proceedings every year. So if you look at the disparity of those numbers, it makes sense to target um, criminals, people with violent crimes, people that pose a threat to our country. It makes sense to focus on those um, individuals first. However, that's not the case anymore. So those priorities have been removed and immigration really is now um, just kind of operating in a everybody is at risk of enforcement um, right now, regardless of how long someone's been here, if they have children, if they're um, contributing to our community. If they don't have one of those specific forms of relief available to them, then um, they're going to be targeted for immigration enforcement. Um, it also did something where um, if you're in immigration court, you have certain protections. Interestingly enough, you don't have the right to a court-appointed attorney, though. So unlike criminal offenders who, if they can't afford That's an attorney, or has it always been? it's always been the way. Oh, okay. um, but, but, but we've always, immigrants have always had the right to a fair hearing in front of a judge. Mm -hmm. That's changed. So if someone who's undocumented has interaction with um, immigration officials and they cannot prove that they've been in the United States for more than two years, mm -hmm. then they're subjected to expedited removal proceedings, which means they would not have necessarily have the opportunity to a hearing or mm -hmm. to be able to plead their case in front of the judge. So one of the things in the Rights and Planning Guide that we can talk about too is just having, um, giving our patrons the information that it's very important to keep records to prove their presence in the United States for the past two years. Mm -hmm. In some forms of immigration relief, you need to prove your presence for a longer period of time. So just educating mm -hmm. about what type of documents we can use to prove um, presence, just giving someone access to maybe checklists that mm -hmm. they can use to organize themselves, because not having access to an opportunity to be heard in front of the judge is a significant change and it's a concern. Um, the executive orders also talk about funding for the law and things of that, na that nature. Mm -hmm. um, the refugee ban is, and parts have been blocked by injunction, but in parts are still going through, and that's concerning. But the most recent executive order um, was issued on September 5th, and it ended the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. Now, that one, I and I read, I've read lots of things about all this, of course, that there's the executive order. And, but I've read that there's also, Congress has a chance to yes. not have that go through. There's, it's not like executive, executive order means immediate. It's, I'm telling some, something about how the Congress can still come up with something in the next six months or something to refute that, to change it, to make yeah. it not. And that would be an act, of, an act of Congress, so like we talked about the DREAM Act. So it kind of gives them an opening to yeah, well, there's always been an opening, and the DREAM mm -hmm. Act has been introduced in front of Congress yeah. a lot of times. Um, but with um, the so DREAM Act is separate, and I think it's something that some people get confused. The DREAM Act is something different, separate from the Deferred Action for yeah. Child Revival. Yeah. I think a lot of people right. are, are confusing those. Yeah. yeah. So, like we talked about, the 
the DACA is just a temporary form of relief, mm -hmm. and it was created by President Obama because of that disparity in the numbers. Um, mm -hmm. There's 11 million undocumented people. You can only put 400,000 in immigration proceedings. Uh, should we really focus on the children who were brought to the United States through no choice of their, of their mm -hmm. own, don't have any criminal convictions, and have met mm -hmm. education requirements? There are a lot of requirements for that, too, I know. That's right. one of the things that's character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so should we prioritize those folks for um, removal or deportation? No. And so that's where the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program came. Mm -hmm. It was basically President Obama's way of saying, like, we're not going to prioritize placing these people into removal proceedings, but we're also going to give them the ability to contribute to our society. Um, mm -hmm through work authorization, social security numbers, driver's license. Nebraska was the last state in the country to allow DACA youth to have mm -hmm. driver's license. So they were, you know, had work authorization but no ability to get yeah. back and forth to work. So so that that's all going away. And Congress can't reinstate the DACA program through executive order, mm -hmm. but they can through um, legislation. Mm -hmm. And there's other bills that have been introduced. There's the Bridge Act mm -hmm. um, that is similar to the DACA program, where it's it's um, providing some type of temporary protection, and then it allows people to try to find another form of immigration relief after a certain period. So and there's 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 lots of legislation pending, but taking away the DACA program may actually spur legislation to become successful, whereas in the past mm -hmm. it has not. So they didn't have to worry about it because something was already keep um, making it okay for these kids. Making it okay. It wasn't as urgent to make yeah, something official right. in the law. Yeah. Right. So the okay. DACA program it was temporary. I know. So it's only two years DACA grants. So these kiddos uh -huh. were having to, they have to redo every two years. years, and it would never lead to residency, never lead to citizenship. So it was not. It was not great, but it was something, and it allowed mm -hmm. these young people to take the next step in their lives. And I see can. how it also helps the um, ICE or anyone involved in. Um, like you said, going after the people who were the criminals or, right. or um, threats to security. Don't waste time and money and energy on these kids right. because th that's a waste of it. When you've got these other ones right. that are more urgent, you really should be talking, you should be focusing on them. This official says, just don't worry about it, it's okay. Right. <laughs> and it helps free up that resources for right. who they should be going after. Yeah. yeah. And it does, I mean, it, it does not make sense to send a child to a country that they don't know the language, they don't know yeah, the culture. Know you know, they, they came to the United States, it's a very, very young child. And they know nothing but us. Yeah. yeah. But it's a, it's a reality for a DACA youth now. It's a very, very real reality. Um, on September 5th, the program was ended. So DACA youth who have their grant of DACA, um, mm -hmm. it remains valid until right. it's natural expiration. So like I said, they're two-year grants. So mm -hmm. on the uh, work authorization, there's a... a yeah, two year period and there's an expiration period. So mm -hmm. our DACA youth are going to remain in deferred action status until the natural expiration of their DACA. If their DACA was going to expire between September 5th and March 5th mm -hmm. of 2018, so September 5th of 2017, this year, yeah. March 5th, 2018, then mm -hmm. they they are able to apply for another two year renewal. I heard there was some sort of a, a yeah, a buffer. But they have to get apply it. before October fifth. So the applications have to be received by uh, okay. the immigration yeah, officials by October fifth. So at Justice for Neighbors we're prioritizing DACA mm -hmm. renewal applications for just those specific um, kiddos. If their DACA expired before September fifth and they just were kind of delaying on renewing because maybe they didn't have a five hundred dollar application fee or something mm -hmm. like that, those young people are out of luck. There is no ability for them to renew. If their DACA expires after March 5th, 2018, mm -hmm. they're also out of luck. There's no. So it's a very small window of. Yeah. Very, very small, small window. Um, and no new applications are being uh, accepted or adjudicated for DACA. Um, so the American Library Association ex responded to President Trump, Trump's executive orders when they first came out earlier this year, and that's at the top of the slide, and mm -hmm. then the ALA also responded to the executive order that was just issued on September 5th, mm -hmm. and um, it's, it's basically just saying that um, they're not in agreement with the mm -hmm. harsh um, executive orders and uh, particularly the Deferred Action for Child Arrivals, they um, 
they want to see a solution. Mm -hmm. So again, and that libraries can, are there to help anyone who is in these uh, precarious situations. Right. We are we are here. Come to us. We'll help right. you figure out where you can go, who we can refer you to, which what libraries have done with all sorts of topics over forever. Right. <laughs> That's right. what we do. Yeah. yeah. So we'll send out the slides afterwards. Yes. And yeah, slides you'll have access to all of this um, after. So don't try and don't you know, just try and scribble down all these URLs. <laughs> Um, this, well, and we don't need to go to it right now, but I've been talking about the rights and safety guide um, throughout the presentation, and there's two places where you can find it, the Nebraska Immigration Legal Assistance Hotline, or NELA.org, mm -hmm. um, it's on the resources tab, mm -hmm. and then it's also on Justice for Our Neighbors website as well, and if we have time, I think we're going way over, if we have time, we can go there. Well, yeah, as I said, we did just hit 11 o'clock, which is our normally our official end time, but we did start late, that was our fault, so um, okay. um, we'll, go, we'll go as long as we need to to finish getting through everything that maybe needs to share, and um, any questions you have um, go ahead and type in your questions as we're talking if you have anything you want to know more about that you might have already heard about or you're wondering um, type it in we'll get to them um, if you do need to leave because you did you know only put into your schedule the one hour don't worry about it we'll have a recording available for you you can watch the rest that you missed um, later but the rights and safety planning guide is basically broken up into two different segments the first half is um, just talking about what um, constitutional rights our community members have and um, undocumented people are protected by the Constitution just mm -hmm. like residents and citizens are and so the rights the know your rights portion um, has uh, just our basic constitutional rights that everybody should know, but we don't, right? Yeah, um, I don't even sometimes know. Right, and so it just talks about, you know, if you're undocumented and there's not a form of relief that's available for you right now, what can you do? Um, for example, if you're at home and um, ICE comes to your door but they don't have a warrant mm -hmm. for you that has your name or your address on it, you don't have to open the door. What people don't know is that ICE officers can yell, scream, they can lie, they well, can, they will. You know? yeah. And so they have right. some stories about it, yeah. Right, and so in the Rights and Planning Guide, uh, there's information about, you know, stay calm, don't open the door, ask the ICE officer to push the warrant underneath the door or hold it up to a window so you can examine it. There's actually pictures of what warrants look like. Oh, cool. There's so some, I wouldn't know what a real one is, looks like as opposed to something right. potentially fake. And something, and it doesn't even have to be fake, it could be an official immigration document, but mm -hmm. unless it's signed by a judge, it's not, it's not a warrant. Yeah. It, you mm -hmm. don't have to open the door. Um, and then it talks about your how your rights are different depending on whether you're driving, whether you're a passenger, whether you're walking on the street, what your rights are at an airport. Something mm -hmm. very tra tragic that's been happening is mm -hmm. um, permanent residents are being asked to kind of denounce their residency when they're at the airport by signing I-407s. And so when you're at the airport, it's already a very stressful environment for everyone. Um, however, if you're asked to sign a form by an immigration officer, sometimes you'll sign the form without really fully understanding, mm -hmm. especially if you don't understand English that well. And so one thing that the Rights and Planning Guide is it shows people what the I-407 looks like and what it is and what it is not. And it talks about if you're arrested, what you should do. Mm -hmm. and uh, the way that removal proceedings work within immigration court. Another important piece of the Rights and Planning Guide is to talk about how to avoid um, being victimized by an unethical attorney or a non-attorney. So there are bad attorneys in every field of law, every okay. area of law, right? But there's a higher proportion of bad attorneys practicing immigration law, and that's primarily because our clients are more susceptible to being victimized, less likely to report malpractice, less, um, more likely to pay cash, things of that nature. So the Rights and Planning Guide has a list of um, attorneys that has um, uh, met certain criteria and are the good apples, so to speak. So if somebody wants to know um, where they should start trying to find immigration legal representation, the Rights and Planning Guide is a really pla good place because it has the private attorneys that have been um, screened, so to speak, but it also has the different nonprofit organizations that someone can reach out to. One thing that's important to note is notaries in the United States are not um, what notaries are in, in a lot of other countries. Uh, so someone that holds themselves out as a notary or a notario um, mm -hmm. can be misleading to our immigrant and so They think they, they have the ability to use something that they don't because yeah. it's different in their countries. Right. Around. And so remember how we talked about um, some people, well, 
um, some unethical people will help um, community members apply for asylum even though they don't qualify, but they'll get their work authorization and then they'll spread the word that this notario or unethical attorney is really, really great and they get more clients. A lot of times it's not attorneys that are doing that. are helping people fill out forms that they should not be applying and will lead the person into removal or deportation proceedings when they otherwise wouldn't have been. Um, so that type of information is in the guide. Also, how to report notarios or the unauthorized practice of law and malpractice by attorneys. The safety planning guide is really just based upon checklists. So this is for someone that's, they may not have a form of immigration relief available to them right now, um, but they still want to know what they can do to protect themselves and their families. So this was just a scenario about someone who may be a DACA youth asking mm -hmm. for help. And you, you're not an attorney, so you can't give legal advice. What do right. you do, right? And that's, that's really a standard I'm, that we all know as librarians. I am not an attorney. I am not a doctor. Yeah. I cannot tell right. you what you should, but I can tell you where you can go to get right. these experts, find these experts who can then right. give you legal advice or medical advice. And so our hopes was that having the rights and planning guide would be an easy way for you to get very, very important information without crossing the line and giving legal advice. Legal advice, it, it could get you in trouble as the a person giving the advice, but it also could hurt the patron if it's not the correct legal advice and maybe get them placed into removal proceedings. So the safety planning guide is, is just something that you can give your patrons to help prepare for um, uncertain circumstances that may happen in the future. Um, we already talked about the size of the DACA program. Basically, the most important thing right now is if somebody's DACA expires um, before March 5th, 2018, make sure you're referring mm -hmm. them to Justice for Neighbors or another mm -hmm. immigration legal service provider so we can help so you. So you guys, you are based, your office is in Omaha. But yeah. um, elsewhere across the state, is there lo are there local offices or how yeah. are there libraries across the state? That's a great um, question. So these are the checklists that are in the resident planning list. Um, also, there's information on how to apply for Justice for Neighbor Services or mm -hmm. other nonprofit immigration legal services, and it's through the Nebraska Immigration Legal Systems Hotline. Okay. That's also the website where you can find the Rights and Planning Guide. Right. So this number, the NELA number, is a toll-free number, and it's a centralized intake system that five nonprofit immigration legal service providers get our cases through. <laughs> so it's a really easy way for librarians or Anywhere immigration you specialists yeah. to give this number, uh, and you can give to anyone, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, oh, do you know somebody who needs immigration legal assistance? They can call this number. It's a free call number. Call on behalf of somebody. And you yeah. can call on behalf mm -hmm. of somebody. A lot of times when you apply for services, you actually have to make the application. This is an exception. Mm -hmm. As long as you have the person with you or you know enough information about their case, you can call on their behalf. Mm -hmm. And um, it's confidential. Uh, the NILA program um, has bilingual paralegals that staff the, the funds, um, cool. the hours are on the website. If somebody doesn't speak English or Spanish, then male paralegals have access to over 50 other languages through phone interpreters that they can get on the phone immediately. Um, the application takes about 20 minutes. If there's a form of immigration relief available, then the male paralegals will refer that case to the organization that can help the person the best, the fastest. So um, the organizations are Justice for Neighbors, my organization, but also Catholic. Mm -hmm. Charities, the Women's Center for mm -hmm. Advancement, Center for Legal Immigration Assistance here in Omaha, mm -hmm. and also Lutheran Family Services. If our organizations can't help that person, then the NILA hotline will send a private attorney referral list, which will have a list of those good alcohol attorneys that people can start with. So you don't necessarily have to tell somebody that needs immigration legal assistance open the phone book. That's a really scary, intimidating thing to do to yeah. that, you know, to try to get an attorney. Um, they can start by calling this number. So Even this is like a clearing house where they can then be um, directed to um, Someone who maybe is more local to them. That yeah, they get help too, more local. Yeah. It, and it's, you know, our nonprofits help low income individuals. Mm -hmm. um, so even if someone's not low income, they could still call this number to get the private attorney referral list. So it'd be a great place to start regardless of your situation. Yeah, that's the thing I think that a lot of, I'm sure a lot of people, I mean, anybody looking for a lawyer for any reason, um, how can I afford that? Right. I don't have money for a lawyer, I barely have money to. Do what I do on a daily right. basis, and you guys do this for. At no we cost. do it for yeah. free. So yeah. Justice for Neighbors provides our services for free. Mm -hmm. Some of the other nonprofit organizations charge nominal fees or do a sliding scale. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so there's options. Yeah, but to answer your questions about justice for neighbors, so our main office is in Omaha, mm -hmm. but we do target um, communities throughout Nebraska that have a mm -hmm. high population of immigrants and a low mm -hmm. number of immigration attorneys. So uh, we sure. are providing local services in Grand Island, Lexington, South Sioux City, and Crete. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, so we either have offices in those communities or we go there on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, like, for example, in Crete, we partnered with the UCC Church and we're there every Tuesday. You know, so we have local mm -hmm. Presences regular, those, yeah. yeah. Um, otherwise, if it's somebody that lives in a uh, not in the metro area, or not in one of those targeted communities, um, we can do consultations via phone. People can come to Omaha. You know, we can we can make it happen. Um, but the reason that we're in those communities is we're trying to just remove barriers and make sure people have access to reliable immigration and legal services when that community is traditionally been underserved. Mm -hmm. But I think that was, I mean, I know I went through everything really, really fast, but this That's is my cool. contact information. Mm -hmm. If anybody has any questions, if you guys mm -hmm. need presentations to your board or your staff, you can always um, see if we're available to come to you. I know I'm going mm -hmm. to Boston Public Library um, okay. in a few weeks. I think it's nice that you have the library experience and knowledge that you're not just an attorney. Sometimes I know coming into the and I'm sure lots of professions say that libraries are kind of a unique institution. <laughs> the things that we do is very different from some whatever. Yeah. And a lot of people attempting to work with us, which is great, don't understand always how we do things, where the rules are, what we can and can't do. And I think having you be both an attorney and librarian um, education really helps yeah. <laughs> understanding yeah. what, we, what we do. And I, I just, I think that the NILA hotline and the rights and planning guide are so important, but unless we know about them, um, you mm -hmm. know, we can't help our community members. I know that when I right. was mm -hmm. in the prison library, um, if I would have had the NILA hotline or the rights and planning guide to help, mm -hmm. it, it would have it would have helped tremendously. I just didn't have access to those things, and yes. so mm -hmm. I want to make sure that everybody has access and making sure that our libraries know about it is, mm -hmm. I think, the best best way. Mm -hmm. and this is what libraries do is providing the information in all sorts of areas, and this is another one that we definitely can do and yeah. make, get the links to those resources out there, promote that it's available. I mean, in your libraries, you know. If you're in one of these communities that has an immigrant population, or if you yeah. have the ones that we didn't mention, but you know your town has them because they're coming in, you see them around town, everybody, you know, you know who's in your town. If you're one of those group places, start putting this stuff out, pushing it, put out a display, mm -hmm. put it on your your racks of documents and things, and flyers and, and brochures, put something together out there. Um, for the people that won't be brave enough to come up and ask, mm -hmm. or will think I have a language barrier issue that I don't speak English and there's nobody here that does that speaks my language, whatever it will be. Mm -hmm. What do I do? Um, put things in different, you know, languages available as well. Um, we do have one question that came in um, that I do want to answer, and I was looking at myself because I wasn't sure, and it relates to, and it's a library question, cool, relates to the Library of Congress change to um, change the so legal yeah. alien, the subject heading change. Did Congress deny the Library of Congress proposal? So, and I did see they, it looks like they are tr they tried, but I can't see that there they was, that they actually have, did. They, yeah. they, there was, yeah, the re Republicans, of course. Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz, yeah. yep, did try, put in a bill saying, no, don't change it. Um, the, the reasoning being the law says, uses the phrase illegal aliens, so everything that relates to what these libraries or like the Library of Congress or, um, legal libraries maybe using should match up with the law. But from what I see, it didn't go through. No, it didn't pass. It was unsuccessful. No. It was unsuccessful. Yes, they tried, but it was unsuccessful. Um, there was luckily a fight against it. Yeah, yeah. It was, I wish I remembered the other um, three Congress. Um, but I know it was spearheaded by Ted Cruz. Yeah, he comes up. And it was unsuccessful. So mm -hmm. the subject heading was changed on uh, March 22nd. It was. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, petition, law, lawmakers object to it, um, House orders Library of Congress to maintain the legal alien, but it didn't, you know, there was a, a bill put through to do that, yeah. but the, you know, these headlines, of course, are a little yeah. busy. Um, That's an interesting <laughs> point about like, our laws use the term legal alien. In California, interestingly enough, amended their state laws to not use the term legal alien anymore. Okay. So yeah, that's I can see that. Yeah. On a state. Maybe one of the states was such yeah. a huge influx of, 
of undocumented that I can see, yeah, or unauthorized citizens that they'd want to be very responsive to. Yeah. So my, you know, our laws were written um, a long time ago in very mm -hmm. archaic language, and that That's doesn't important. mean that, that we need to continue to use it. Just like lots of other laws that are no longer applicable right. or need modification. <laughs> right. yeah. You got to change with the times. Yeah. That was an awesome mm -hmm. question. Thank you. It's good to bring that out to remember that so people do know, yes, we did mention that it was a thing, but and yes, there was a, mm -hmm. a um, attempt to not have it go through with it. Right. I didn't. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So, anybody have any other questions? Everybody is still here. Awesome. Thank you guys for sticking around. <laughs> we ran a little late. Um, does anybody have any questions they want to ask of Mindy? Anything you want to know more about? Um, has there been a particular situation in your town that you want to ask about? Um, or do you have any tips or tricks or things that you've done at your library that might um, help other people? Let us know. Uh, I know you went through some of these slides quick with the different, the lists of... Um, yeah, so in the safety planning portion. Yeah, checklists. Yeah. yeah. And so these are things that um, if somebody wants to know, like, how can I prepare for possible interaction with ICE officer possible detention, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to want to have these things in a safe mm -hmm. place, and you're going to want to make sure that you have um, a trusted person in charge of being able to retrieve these documents right. if you need them. And at libraries, we can help people get some of these things, too, if they don't have a copy of their birth certificate. How do right. you, where do we go to get one? Um, how do I get a passport? Yeah, um, and the, in the yeah. resident planning guide, it actually has at copies of the applications on how to get birth certificates from mm -hmm. our state mm -hmm. uh, and then common countries where our community members uh, oh, okay. may have mm -hmm. come from uh, but we have um, community members that have children that have been born in other states and they're going to need right. um, help Not just Nebraska you know. you know getting copies of those birth certificates where they may need help um, getting proof of presence for the last mm -hmm. two years and maybe having a printout of when they got their library card is maybe the only thing that they can think of. That could be, you know, yeah. Um, medical records for their children, school records for their children or themselves, receipts, photographs, leases, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times there's limited access to those records for a lot of the reasons we already talked about. And maybe having some, the library card is mm -hmm. one, yeah, one, one small way that we can prove presence. I got this on, in 2012, yeah. so I, yeah. obviously I was here then. Yeah. Um, if you have children, you want to think about um, it, is there someone that you trust to be able to make decisions um, for your children if you were detained and unable to do so. Mm -hmm. It's very, very important um, if there's a situation where both parents or the, the primary parent is detained and not able to pick up their kids from school or from daycare, um, then you will have the involvement of um, Department of Health and Human Services, maybe unnecessary. Right. So there's information about that. If your child was born in the United States and there's a risk of you being removed or deported and uh, you would like to remain uh, intact as a family, then you need to make sure to talk to the consulate of your home country to register your child in your home country. Because if you're removed with your children, um, they may not have access to school, to benefits, to medical services unless they're registered. That's something that we can do now. And so providing resources. Things we have to prepare. Yeah. 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 I think a lot of things that we don't think about. Um, or, you know, things like, does somebody else have a copy of your car key? You know, like, do somebody else, your house, your yeah. yeah, do you have money saved to pay for an attorney if you need one? You know, it's just things that, um, you know, if, if somebody is really feeling powerless right now because there may not be a form of immigration relief, um, having them prepare for uncertain futures will just mm -hmm. restore a little bit of power, make somebody feel like mm -hmm. they're doing, at least they're doing what they can now. To feel a little to more prepare. confident that yeah. I at least I did what I could, yeah. Um, Awesome. Um, let's pop out to, I just want to briefly have you show, do you want to show the website where that um, guide is? Yeah, hit escape there, and then, yeah, down to the Firefox link there. Okay, so we're going to go just to quickly show this just for a couple of seconds. You can see this is the um, website that uh, maybe was mentioned. Yeah, so the NILA hotline, the number's right here, and then the mm -hmm. hours are right here. Mm -hmm. uh, but to get to the guide, you go to the resources tab, and then you're going to go to rights and planning guide. Oh, pop to Wikipedia. Awesome. And the table of contents is a great place to start, and it's all hyperlinked. So if you know somebody just needs help um, 
uh, knowing what their rights are, you can start with that portion. If you know somebody just needs help preparing for an uncertain future, you can start with the, the As checklist. I see, it's in English and Spanish. Everything's in English and Spanish, yeah. Um, so if you want to help somebody with their checklist, you can literally just use the hyperlink and get to the checklist. And so right here it'll say like, oh, you should have your passport. Well, if you don't have a passport from your home country, that can be very intimidating to try mm -hmm. to do from here. So you can go um, you can go to page 80 and it will give directions on how to get passports from some of the most common countries that our community mm -hmm. members come from. Birth certificate, same thing. So it not only is, is giving the information what what our community members should have gathered and readily accessible, but it's giving them information on how they gather those documents if they don't have them. That's good because it's going to vary from uh, country to country. Yeah, right. And, they're, you're, and person to person. Yeah, yeah. Well, country to country mainly is what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. That's good. Okay. Doesn't look like anybody has typed in any urgent questions that they need answered right away. <laughs> That's okay. Um, you'll have. Um, well, you have this resource, you have the 800 number from the site. Um, you can, of course, always call Mindy whenever with any other questions you might have. There's her contact info. Uh, do you occur? Yeah, there we go, there. Um, and for anything you do come up with. Um, so I think we will wrap it up for today. We're a little bit over, not a problem. Any last words you want to say before we? Just my little wrap up. <laughs> I mean, thank you for having me. And yeah, absolutely. Um, you know what you guys do. You're welcome. We, we try to um, share as much on the show and through the Library Commission anything anything and everything libraries might need um, to do what they're doing. And um, like I said, I you know I, I watch the news myself. I've seen what's going on with the situation. I knew it was lots of things are happening that we just don't know what to deal with. And then you know I saw you done a session this summer and I said that's it. I'm going to do that on the show and we're going to um, get it recorded and out there so that now anyone who wasn't able to either attend this in-person sessions you've done, um, the will have this recording as a resource. So um, share it with anybody you know out there who might be in this situation or someone who you know might know somebody who mm -hmm. might be here. How would you want to do it? <laughs> All right. So that will wrap it up for today's show. I'm going to pop back out again to the website. Um, and I'm just going to go here. Um, yeah. So um, that will wrap it up for today's show. Uh, Encompass Live, we have our website here. Luckily, so far, we are the only thing called this on the internet. Yay. So when you Google us, as I just did there, it, all these results that come up are us. Um, so here is our current Encompass Live website. The recording, um, as I said, the show is being recorded, and we posted probably later this afternoon to our website. Right here is our current upcoming shows, but here is where our archives are. Most recent ones go at the top of the list, so you don't have to scroll down or anything. So right above here, later today, I will post the link to today's show. I'll have the PowerPoint slides will be up there. And um, I'll add a link to this um, website as well, since that's the one major yeah. website that you mentioned during the show. That'll be in there as well, so you can jump to that. Along with any of other, there was that resources page in the slides as well. All that, you'll have all those links. Um, everyone who attended here live today or uh, registered for today's show will get an email sent to you letting you know when the recording is available, but then it will be possible to promote that out on our website and our Facebook page and Twitter to let everybody out there know that it's um, available. So that will be for today's show. I uh, hope you join us next week when our topic is weeding your library collection. Weeding. Um, we weed our gardens. We've got to weed, weed our libraries. Uh, for some people, this is an easy thing. They do it regularly at the library. For some other people, it's a, it's a struggle. <laughs> um, but what do you do? How are you supposed to do it? What are you supposed to keep or not keep? Um, how do you convince people that it's OK? <laughs> that you're getting rid of things. Uh, Denise Harders is our co-director of our Central Plains Library System. It's a center part of the state here in Nebraska. And she will be with us next week to talk about um, how to give you some tips and tricks for that. And also talk about a program they have there that they've been doing for quite a few years. Um, they're a month of weeding. They have a competition. Um, amongst their libraries, so you can hear about that. So do sign up for that and any of our other shows coming up. You'll note here that October 11th is, is no show that week. This is the one year, one week of the year that we do not hold in Compass Live. We are on, we are here every week 
51 weeks of the year, not 52, because this is the year of, this is the week of our uh, lab, Nebraska Library Association and Nebraska School Librarians Association annual conference. So that week we don't hold the show because everybody's off to conference, um, including us, <laughs> uh, myself. So um, if you're here in Nebraska or if you're just interested, registration is still open um, till the 23rd, the end of uh, this weekend. So um, definitely register, um, come out and join us in Kearney for this year's conference because we won't be here on Encompass Live. Uh, so Encompass Live is on Facebook. We have a Facebook page where we post when shows are available, when what the upcoming shows are, we announce when our recordings are ready. So um, if you are big on Facebook, um, please do give us a like there. Here, for example, I posted a notice this morning letting people know they could log in on the fly to today's show if they didn't pre-register. Um, so, if you're big on getting your notifications and updates and things through uh, Facebook, like our page for the show over there. Other than that, that wraps it up for this morning. Thank you much, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Nikki, for coming down and joining us this morning. Um, and we will see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye. -bye.